I'm sure that almost every basketball fan has seen this dunk. I can also bet that most fans know who this man is. Why, of course, it's none other than Dr. J. See, now what if I told you this happened while the good doctor played for the ABA? I bet I lost some of you, and that's alright. And here's why I'm probably going to lose the majority of you. What if I told you this dunk happened during the first ever dunk contest? And this dunk contest occurred during halftime of an all-star game that couldn't even field two all-star teams. And the idea of this contest came about because some guy couldn't book the music acts he wanted to and just made it all up. You're probably telling yourself, wow, what a beautiful accident. That's crazy that the dunk contest was basically just winged. Well, what if I told you that this dunk contest, this iconic moment, is the perfect microcosm of the ABA. A league that is just a bunch of people winging it that created one of the most beautiful accidents ever. Starting the year 1965 with a genius idea by a man named Dennis Murphy. Murphy's idea was to create an AFL team in Anaheim and wait for the AFL and NFL merger to happen, in which case Murphy would become a proud owner of an NFL team and get rich in the process. Or Murphy would get bought out by the NFL and get rich in the process. It's really a win-win scenario. Murphy was damn close to having his idea become reality too. Having former Cardinals quarterback Jim Hardy on board gave him credibility to other investors and the AFL and Murphy was ready to execute on his plan. That's when a nuke dropped. The AFL and NFL merger happened, leaving Murphy's idea impossible because the NFL would never accept a team in Anaheim with the LA Rams just down the road. Now Murphy doesn't let this get him down. He still has finances and he still wants to make money. That's when he comes up with the idea for another basketball league. Murphy's quoted saying, there's only one basketball league and only one hockey league, so why not another? Since basketball was Murphy's favorite sport, he chose, well, basketball. Thus, the idea of the ABA was born. With the change to a basketball league, this left Jim Hardy in an awkward position, and he left the venture. However, soon after, Murphy joined teams with Bill Sharman, who was the ex-coach of the Long Beach team in the ABL, which is another defunct basketball league. Sharman came up with the name the American Basketball Association, or ABA for short. Sharman suggested that the ABA should have a three-point line, just like the ABL. The partnership with Sharman was amazing, but it didn't last long. Sharman was hired as the Warriors head coach and thusly had to leave the venture. However, he left with some advice, and that advice was to get George Mikan. There's a reason that Sherman's last words of advice were to go get George Mikan. Mikan at the time was the greatest basketball player to ever do it. Given the nickname Mr. Basketball, Mikan was really the first ever NBA superstar, and by far the best player of his time. He finished his short seven-year career averaging 23 points and 13 rebounds. Mikan also finished his career with five NBA championships, and in the 1952-53 season, he won the MVP. Not only was Mikan a great basketball player, which would give the league some credibility, he also had a law degree and has been running a successful business in Minneapolis. Murphy was able to gain contact with Mikan through his neighbor, who knew Mikan through his insurance business. Murphy called up Mikan and offered him the illustrious job of the first ABA commissioner. Mikan was really skeptical at first and was stern in contract negotiations, but he finally agreed to be the commissioner 10 minutes before the press conference to announce the league. But he had three demands. One, the headquarters has to be moved from New York to Minneapolis. Mikan didn't want to move away from his business for a stupid startup basketball league. Two, there had to be a three-point line. Mikan thought it would be helpful to make the league different from the NBA, which at the time did not have the line. And three, the ball has to be red, white, and blue. Um... I'll explain that one a little later. 
The league accepted all of Mikan's demands without much hesitation. You see, the stakeholders really thought Mikan would make or break this league. The reason for this is because Mikan can really get a meeting with anyone he wants. Like I said, he is the best to ever do it. Not only could he get you the meeting, you can also trust him to run the meeting by himself because of his prior business experience. To boil it down, the owners weren't sure the league would get off the ground without someone like Mikan. So really, the decision was easy. Did they want a league or not? Because if they did, they have to give in to Mikan's demands. Now to circle back to what you're all thinking. Why the hell was one of his demands a red, white, and blue ball? Well, really the demand was a ball that wasn't the standard brown and one that was, well, colorful. The reason for this is, as you can see, Mikan wore glasses. And his vision wasn't great. He even wore glasses during his playing career, while he played. Crazy, right? Well, Mikan would watch basketball on TV and go to games after he retired. And he would always get pissed off because he couldn't see the ball too well. So, he wanted a colorful ball. Why red, white, and blue? Well, I mean, it is the American Basketball Association. The red, white, and blue ball might be the most memorable thing about the ABA. It absolutely caught fire, becoming the playground basketball of the 1970s. Like, for real, if you have a parent that grew up during this era, pause this video right now and ask them if they had the ball growing up. My best bet is that most did. See, here's the problem. While the ball blew up on the playground, no one in the ABA ever capitalized on its success. The ABA never created a licensing deal to sell the ball with their logo on it, nor did they ever create a patent for its design. The lack of the ABA capitalizing on their money printing machine is a great example of what the true goal of the league really was. It was never supposed to make money. It was just supposed to last long enough and get big enough to merge with the NBA, and nothing else. There really wasn't this big grandiose plan behind it. Well, maybe it is pretty grandiose. But the league does have all the ingredients to make this happen. Strong leadership behind Murphy and Mikan. Aspects of the league that make it stand out with the three-point line in the ball. And finally, 11 great teams that you're about to meet. First, we have the Pittsburgh Pipers. The Minnesota Muskies. The Indiana Pacers. The Kentucky Colonels. The New Jersey Americans. The New Orleans Buccaneers. The Dallas Ch Chaparrals? What? No, how? What? What is that word? I had to have spelled that wrong, right? No, that's, that's spelled right. One second, what? Chaparral. Chaparral. Sharperal. Oh, whatever. The Dallas Chaparrals. The Denver Rockets. The Houston Mavericks. The Anaheim Amigos.
And lastly, the Oakland Oaks. Well, there it is. We have our teams. Now all we need is players. And I hear the Dallas Chaparrales are well on their way to being ready for the draft. Meet Max Williams. He's the general manager for the Dallas Chaparrales, and just like many other front office members around the league, he's getting ready for the first ever draft. He's got his scouting done, and he's put a list together of players that he wants. Just a few days ago, he gave this list to his owner, Ronald Speth. Speth and Williams haven't had a meeting about the list yet, but Williams doesn't think much about it. They have plenty of time before the draft. Well, at least Speth doesn't seem like he's in any hurry. Finally, a couple of days after giving the list to Speth, he comes into Williams' office saying he drafted last night. Williams, who is visibly frustrated and confused, asks Speth, What the hell, bro? What do you mean you drafted? Why wasn't I there? You don't know anything about basketball. Speth explains to Williams, Well, I couldn't find you to take you to the draft. But don't worry. I took your list, and we got our top five guys. Williams gets even more confused and asks Speth what he means by he got our top five guys. Speth responds, saying he got the first five guys on the list that Williams gave him. Williams explains to Speth that the order of that list was not an order of talent or even desired player. The list was literally in alphabetical order. played guitar jamming good with weird and gilly and the spiders from Mars they've played it left hand but made it too far became the special man yeah that's right the Dallas Chaparral selected Matt Eich with their first round pick solely because his last name started with the letter A I I can't even make up this level of incompetency that was dumb. Let's stay dumb. With the same dumb person, Ronald Speth. But first, let's meet Terry Stembridge, a local high school history teacher. And you see, Stembridge did his school's radio broadcast and loves doing it. And, well, he caught wind of a new professional basketball team coming to the area and wanted to shoot a shot about being the first ever radio broadcaster of the Dallas Chaparrales. So he gets in contact with Speth, asking him if the position is still open. Which it is, and Speth tells him to put a demo tape together, and he would give him a call back when he got to them. A couple of days pass, and Stembridge calls Speth up, asking him if he was able to listen to the tapes. Speth said he did, and he would love to meet with Terry once he was back in the Dallas area. So a couple of days pass, and Stembridge shows up to Speth's hotel room for the meeting. During the meeting, all Speth did was talk up the team, and he let Terry know he didn't actually listen to the tapes yet. Which obviously confused Terry. As Speth already said he listened to the tapes, and if he didn't listen to tapes, why the heck are they having this meeting? Well, a few weeks after the meeting, Stembridge calls up Speth again and asks him about the status of the position. Speth excitedly tells Terry that he has the job and then he would send him a contract his way within a week or so. Three weeks go by without a contract reaching Stembridge, and Terry calls up the front office where he's informed that Speth sold the team to a man named Bob Folsom. Alright, so a quick side note, this isn't the first and it definitely won't be the last time that a team gets sold. Uh, the Oakland Oaks and Dennis Murphy already had to sell part of his team away. He sold it to other financial groups to help finance the team and to another party, which will be explained later. Uh, but I think a large reason that these owners are selling off, especially these early owners, are because one, they might not have seen these teams as being profitable as early on. And two, the price point of these teams to buy in is, ex is staggeringly low. It's $5,000 at the time, which equates about just over $48,000 today. I know that's a lot of money. Don't get me wrong. But I truly think that me, the 10, the 12 other friends could scrape together $48,000. I'm saying that as a college student that cannot support a basketball team. I can't do anything about the contracts or anything after that. And I don't know if any of the other owners 
or in a similar situation where they just want to make quick money and resell the team and flip it, which might be possible. Um, another reason they might have just sold off is that they just didn't care, really, and they might have gotten a decent offer. It doesn't really matter. I just thought that was an interesting fact. Back to the video. Stembridge got in contact with Folsom and explained the situation to him. Folsom had no knowledge of the agreement between Stembridge and Spath, and didn't know what the heck he was talking about about tapes. However, Folsom did uphold Spath's verbal agreement, except there's one issue. The Chaparrales don't have a radio deal yet. After the meeting where they hit it off, Folsom went as far as offering the position of PR director to Stembridge, and would allow him to do the radio broadcasting too if they get the deal. Stembridge accepts the offer, and officially joins the Chaparral's front office. When Stembridge shows up to the front office, he realizes it's a really small staff, and only included Max Williams, a ticket manager, and a secretary. Stembridge and Williams were really the only ones who did anything, and they got all the work done. So, let's recap real quick. Stembridge, a high school history teacher who had done radio broadcasts for his school, shoots his shot to become the radio broadcaster to a new franchise that is owned by a man who drafted alphabetically. That same man is in the process of selling the team, but gave Stembridge the job anyway. Stembridge then gets offered the job of PR director by a new, also incompetent owner, and joins the front office. And finally, when he is there, he is shoehorned into basically acting as assistant general manager, equipment manager, and many other roles because the front office is so small. With the front office set, the Chaparrales are ready for their home opener against the Anaheim Amigos. The Chaparrales will end up winning this game 129-125, to and they are led by leading scorer Cliff Hagen, who had 35. The Chaparrales acquired Hagen and, well, the rest of the roster, as no one they actually drafted and made the team. The same way most of the league filled the rosters, by signing players that either didn't make the NBA and were playing overseas, or NBA players that either fizzled out or retired. Hagen was a great get for the Chaparrales. Not only was he a former NBA champion with the Hawks, he made six All-Star teams and two All-NBA teams. And to make it even better, Hagen just hung up his shoes one year ago. But there was a problem. Hagen got into fights like all the time and would subsequently get ejected. And this would be frustrating for the front office, because not only did they lose their best player, but they would lose their head coach. You see, Hagen was a player coach, and while that might be a strange concept in today's game, it wasn't unheard of in the 1960s. Famously, Bill Russell was a player coach for three years and won the 1968 and 69 titles. The frustration boiled over about 60 games since the season, when the Chaparrales had Kids Day at the stadium. In this game, Hagen got elbowed by Minnesota's Les Hunter and subsequently knocked him out with what Terry Stembridge described as an unbelievable right-left-right -right combination. <laughs> After this incident, Hagen was approached by Max Williams. Max told him if he gets ejected again, he'll be fined $2,500, which is just over $21,000 in today's money. Hagen responded to Williams with, If I can't fight, I can't play. Max then explained to Hagen that they heard him more as a coach and asked him if he would just stop playing and just coach. Hagen agreed because, as he said, he can't play if he can't fight. And that's what Hagen did for the rest of the season except when he put himself in against the Amigos with 40 seconds left and clocked another guy. Although, the ref didn't see it, so Hagen did hold on to his 2.5k. Yeah, that's right, the Chaparral's finished second in the conference and booked their ticket to the first ever ABA playoffs. But one team did better, and that was the Buccaneers, and they were led by a pair of best friends, and their names were Larry and Mo. Lean on me when you're not strong, and I'll be your friend. I'll help you carry on for it won't be long till I'm gonna need Wait. Not, not those guys. Th these guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Larry Brown and Doug Moe. Some of you may know Larry Brown, who, by the way, is on the left. 
as the coach who won the title with the 04 Pistons and was elected as a top 15 coach of all time during the recent NBA 75. But this is before all of that. Larry is a recent UNC graduate and is currently the assistant coach for them. But he was approached by the Buccaneers to join the ABA as a player. Larry said he would only join if they got his best friend and UNC teammate, Doug Moe, to join the team. The Buccaneers said yes, and thusly, the ultimate ABA bromance was born. And I mean that. Larry and Doug did everything together. They even negotiated contracts together. Not only did they negotiate them together, Doug negotiated Larry's contract to be $10,000 more than the original offer. This negotiation made it so that Larry was paid more than Doug himself. If that ain't friendship, then I don't know what the hell is. Doug was not only a great friend to Larry, but an amazing teammate. Doug was one of the best defenders in the league and had an amazing skill set. He was so skilled, he would often switch hands he would shoot with. What I mean by that is if his jumper wasn't falling with his right hand, Doug would simply just start shooting with his left. Larry and Doug would both end up making the All-Star team this year, and Larry would bring home with him the first ever All-Star MVP trophy. By the end of the season, Larry ended up leading the league in assists, and Doug was named to the All-ABA team. Needless to say, the Buccaneers behind these two guys were primed for a deep playoff run. This won't be the last time we hear of Larry and Doug, but at the moment, let's check out how the rest of the West did. Oh, Spongebob me boy. It's just Les Sauvage's three-point attempts. He led the Amigos in three-point attempts. Let's see how he stacks up against the other team leaders. Shot to the heart, and you're too late, darling. You give love a bad name. Okay. Really? Oh, okay. I'll I'll, I'll fix that. Uh, all right, guys. That was my editor. He just told me that those weren't the team's leaders in three-point attempts. Those are the team's three-point attempts. Wait. Aren't I the editor? <laughs> Les Sauvage took more threes by himself than every single team but one. He really became infatuated with the three. He never played with the line before, and he shot more threes in his first season with it than Steph did in his first season in the NBA. 
In fact, Les's three-point numbers stack up against modern NBA players. In this chart, I have the vertical axis being three-point percentage and the horizontal axis being three-point attempts. Les is the little green dot, and he ranked 35th in three-point attempts, right in between Jalen Brown and Bogdan Bogdanovich. But I think the more interesting fact is that Les did not have the worst three-point percentage on this chart. Les shot a not-great 31.9% from the field. However, Jordan Clarkson shot 31.8%. That is so nuts to me. Clarkson grew up with the three-point line. Les, on the other hand, is playing with it for the first time in this season. Now, I don't think it's necessarily fair to compare Les to the modern NBA. Let's put him up on an even playing field. This chart is the exact same, except I put him up against every player that shot over 100 threes in the 1979 NBA season, which is the first year the NBA had the line. On this chart, Les almost laps second place to Brian Taylor, who has 239 shots. Additionally, Les is just above average on the three-point percentage as well. Les really was before his time, and he helped show the feasibility of the three-point line. You really have Les to thank for how the modern NBA is today. And he really was the newest show in town. The Pipers end up having the best record in the league, and they're led by the best player of the season, Connie Hawkins. Connie didn't have an easy road to becoming the best player in the ABA. Born to a blind mother in Brooklyn, Connie didn't have an easy way of growing up. Him and his mother survived off welfare. But Connie found solace in all of his life in basketball. Growing up, Connie became a playground legend at the famous Rutger Park. Rutger Park back then and to this day housed some of the best pickup basketball of all time. Some players who got their start at this playground that you may know include Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Ron Artest, Chris Mullen, Kevin Durant, Jamal Mashburn, and even Dr. J. And many more that I didn't get to the list. Connie went on to win two consecutive city titles with his high school and was thrown into an intense recruiting battle, where he ended up signing with the University of Iowa. But tragedy struck after his freshman year when he was accused of being part of the 1961 college gambling scandal. The scandal happened when 37 students were arrested for shaving points from NCAA games. Doug Moe was also caught up in this scandal. Moe admitted to receiving money from the scandal, but denied ever point shaving. But Moe had graduated by the time the scandal broke and never faced any repercussions. Connie, on the other hand, was never actually involved and was never convicted of anything. However, despite not being involved at all, Iowa kicked him off the team and the NCAA banned him from playing because of his alleged association with the scandal. The NBA also banned Connie because of his association with the scandal, leaving Connie in sort of a state of basketball limbo. He ended up playing for the defunct ABL for a season and won MVP in the league at just the age of 19. However, the league folded just 14 games into their second season, leaving Connie with no job. He later joined the Harlem Globetrotters, but he hated it. Connie was 25 when the ABA formed, and he jumped at the opportunity. He got a $5,000 signing bonus and a salary of $40,000 over two years. Connie, with his newfound money, hired a lawyer and started suing the NBA to allow him to play in the league. But while his lawyer was dealing with that, Connie was dominating the ABA. Connie in his first season with the Pipers averaged 26.8 points, 13.5 rebounds, and 4.6 assists per game, leading the Pipers in all three statistical categories. Connie ended up being the lead leaguer in points per game as well, and he did all of this while seemingly not to be even trying. ABA journeyman Steve Jones was quoted saying he was maybe three levels above everyone else, and he could easily get his 25 to 30 points and 10 to 12 rebounds every night. Although Connie was the best player on the court every time he played, he made sure to get his teammates involved because that's just how Connie thought the game should be played. Connie's teammate Charlie Williams believed Connie could average 50 points per game if he wanted to, but Connie would never say, give me the ball during the game. He would always say, let's move the ball around, let everyone touch it. Everyone wanted Connie to shoot the ball more, his coach, his teammates, and even the commissioner George Mikan. Mikan wanted Connie to average more points and to average 50 because it would have given the league more publicity. But Connie didn't care. He was going to play basketball the way he thought was right, and who was going to stop him? Certainly not any defenders. Connie led the Pipers to a 54-24 record, the best in the league, 
and on the way, Connie acquired some impressive hardware. Made the All-Star team, was selected to the All-ABA team, won the scoring title, and was the league's first ever MVP. But Connie hadn't even started trying yet. He wouldn't do that until the playoffs. In the first round, Connie dismantles the Pacers while averaging 29.3 points on 60% shooting while grabbing 14.7 rebounds per game along the way. The Pipers will sweep the Pacers 3-0 in a decisive manner as the closest game was 121-108. The Pipers will move on to play the Muskies who beat the Colonels in a close 3-2 series. The Muskies are led by Rookie of the Year Mel Daniels who averaged 25.4 points and 16.4 rebounds in this series. In the Eastern Conference, Larry and Doug's Buccaneers are facing off against the Denver Rockets, who are led by All-ABA member Larry Jones. The Buccaneers win the decisive Game 5 where Larry and Doug combined for 39 points. The Buccaneers won this game 102-97, and they will advance to the second round. The Buccaneers will face off against the Chaparrales, who were able to sweep the Houston Mavericks thanks to the coaching of Cliff Hagen. In the second round, the Bromance was able to beat the Chaparrales without much of a fight as the Buccaneers won the series 4-1. They were led in scoring by four Jimmy Jones, who averaged 24 points per game in the series. Larry Brown ended the Chaparrales in Game 5 when he scored 27 points and led the Buccaneers to a one-point victory. Connie's path of destruction continues when the Pipers beat the Muskies in the Conference Finals 4-1. The Pipers only lost Game 2 because of a Herculean effort by Muskie's rookie sensation, Mel Daniels, when he put up 38 points on 50% shooting while grabbing 27 rebounds. Connie, however, managed to average 29.4 points in the series, with a series high of 38 in Game 4. The Pipers advance to the finals, and Connie is on a collision course to face off against the Bromance. In the first game of the finals, the Bromance was able to put up a combined 37 points while pulling down 17 rebounds. Larry Brown struggled in the first game, only scoring 7 points on 25% shooting. However, Doug Moe picked up his slack with getting a nice double-double. The Buccaneers had no answer for Connie, as he put up an insane 31 points on 74% shooting. While doing that, Connie was one rebound away from the double-double. The Pipers ended up winning the first game of the series 120-112. The Pipers were led in scoring by Connie, with the help of Art Heyman and Charlie Williams, who both put up a respectable 26 points. The Pipers defend home court and take the series lead. In Game 2, Larry Brown bounces back, scoring 28 points on 50% shooting. While he didn't grab any rebounds in the game, Doug Moe was able to make up for that, grabbing 11. Moe had 22 points on a rough 38% from the field. But for the first time in the playoffs, Connie Hawkins looked human. He was only able to put up 18 points and grab 10 rebounds, while shooting a measly 39% from the field. Connie didn't even lead the Pipers in scoring, as Charlie Williams put up 27 points. With Connie struggling, the Buccaneers were able to steal Game 2, with the final score of 109-100. to The Buccaneers even up the series and are heading back to their home court for Game 3. In Game 3, the Buccaneers were once again able to neutralize Connie, as he was only able to get 19 points and 11 rebounds on 35% shooting. Once again, Connie was not the leading scorer of the Pipers, which would be guard Chico Vaughn, who had 27 points. Larry Brown and Doug Moe were able to combine for a subpar 39 points and 18 rebounds. The Bromance had a rough night shooting, but their slack was picked up by center Red Robbins and forward Jimmy Jones. Red had 32 points and a staggering 22 rebounds, while Jones was able to put up 26 points on 44% from the field. The Buccaneers defend home court, beating the Pipers 109-101, and they take a 2-1 series lead.
After losing two games in a row and being relatively ineffective for Connie's standards, Connie goes on an all-time performance in Game 4, where he erupts for 47 points on 50% shooting, grabbing 12 rebounds along the way. The Brown match tried their best to match Connie's production, as Larry Brown gets 18 points and an impressive 8 rebounds for the 5'9 guard. Sadly, Larry's shooting percentage was less than ideal in this game, where he ended up shooting just 33%. Doug Moe ended up getting 22 points and 9 rebounds, as well as a pretty good shooting percentage of 45%. But their joint effort just fell short as the Pipers win this game 106-105. The Pipers really needed every single point that Connie scored. Alright, so I'm not going to lie to you, uh, Game 5 from the statistical analysis side kind of sucks. Uh, Connie, first of all, didn't play in this game due to a knee injury. He will be back for Game 6. Um, but additionally, the rebound stat and the field goal percentage stat was not tracked in this game. I cannot find it anywhere on the internet how many shots any player took or how many rebounds were taken down. Um, side note 2 on that. I was going to be tracking the assists because that's what Larry Brown does. He's a point guard. He led the team in assists. He led the league in assists. But that wasn't tracked during the series at all either. So Larry Brown ended up having 17 points in this game, and Doug Moe ended up having 31. The Pipers uh, somehow do stay in it with Charlie Williams having 29 and Chico Vaughn having 28. But at the end, it didn't really matter. Uh, the Buccaneers won 111 to 108. Three-point victory somehow. Uh, they lead the series 3-2. to two. I don't think there's much reason to stay on Game 5 for much longer since there isn't any analysis to really do. Let's move on to Game 6. Connie, coming off his injury in Game 5, entered the must-win Game 6 with vengeance on his mind. Connie scored 41 points on an impossible 68% shooting from the field while grabbing 12 rebounds along the way. Romance had no answers this game, as they had one of their worst performances yet. They only combined for 36 points and 12 rebounds, and as has been the trend for this series, Larry Brown struggled to score, and his shooting percentage reflected that, with it just being 33%. While Doug Moe had an impressive 48%, it seems like jump change compared to Connie's 68. Final score ended up being 118 to 112 in favor of the Pipers, as they force a Game 7 back onto their home court. We start Game 7 with the Pipers winning the tip, and scoring the first points thanks to this amazing pass by Charlie Williams. But the Buccaneers are not short on offense either, as Doug Moe comes down the court and hits a nice mid-range jump shot. The first quarter was a tight battle with a lot of scoring, but by the end of it, the Pipers had the lead with a score of 32-36. to In the second quarter, Larry Brown and Connie Hawkins are able to add to their unknown assist totals with these two plays. We at least know they got some in this series. Connie, after grabbing a rebound, is able to make a beautiful outlet pass to Art Heyman, who was able to leak out on this play. The Pipers were able to dominate the second quarter, scoring 31 points to the Buccaneers' 23. The score at half is 67-55, to Pipers with the lead. Despite amazing efforts like this from Doug Moe, the Pipers were able to surmount an amazing lead, which got as high as 20 points in the third quarter. But it wasn't all Doug Moe who helped the Buccaneers get back into this game. Larry Brown was able to add some points to the total with this beautiful pull-up mid-range jumper. However, at the end of the quarter, the Pipers had a commanding lead with the score being 102-86. to it's going to take a lot of effort from the Buccaneers to come back in this one. Thanks to plays like this from Larry Brown, the Buccaneers were able to come back in this game, getting the score as close as 5 points on 3 different occasions in the quarter. But the Buccaneers efforts fell short as the Pipers win game 7, with the final score being 122-113. to The leading scorer for both teams was Charlie Williams who had 35 points on 60% shooting. Connie ended up having 20 points on 67% shooting while grabbing an amazing 13 rebounds. Larry Brown and Doug Moe both played well in this game, with Larry Brown having 18 points on 50% shooting, tying his series best, while Moe finished with an amazing 28 and 8 rebounds. 
Connie ended up winning Finals MVP. He averaged 30 points and 11.2 rebounds in the series. The Pipers won all four games really because of Connie. When he played well, so did the Pipers. He really was the most valuable player on the court, and he deserved the MVP for not only the Finals, but the regular season as well. But the league struggled in the first year, with losing $2.5 million. And this was apparent when it came to the trophies for the series. All I was able to find was that the players won these small trophies as they measured just 9 inches in height, and by one account, they were made out of plastic. The players also got $4,000 and a handshake. No rings were ever given out to the team, and they were eventually made by one of the players 14 years later, but it kind of feels like a slap in the face for all the work they did. The only trophy photo I was able to find online was the one given to Leroy Wright. As it was auctioned off in 2014, it sold for just under $2,000. The league claimed to draw just under 3,000 fans per game during their inaugural season, but by all accounts, that was a massive overestimate, as no one really showed up to any of the regular season games, and the shots from Game 7 were very much handpicked. But I want to leave this part off with us celebrating what the Pittsburgh Pipers were able to do, because in my opinion, not enough people appreciate it when it all actually happened over 50 years ago. has been an official ABA presentation in association with Pro-Keds, a division of Uniroyal, and the 3M Company. <laughs>